I have been accused. I have been accused by some of you, and you know who you are, to have a bad influence on their TBRs and book buying bans. And to that, I have only one thing to say. Challenge accepted. Hi friends, my name is Bart, welcome back to the channel and this week I'm going to ruin your book buying ban. This week we're going to talk about some hidden gems. I've got some book recommendations for you that you won't see on the book talks and bookstagrams of the world. Books that never seem to make it on the radar and yet they should be. They are entertaining, they are good and they are must read books. So this week I will champion the hidden gems the underdogs of bookish social media, let's go. So as always, I will link every book I talk about down below in the description box so you can do your own research. First off, there's the Nightside series by Simon R. Green, a superb 12th novel fantasy series. But hear me out, it's not just your classical fantasy. This is a strange eclectical mix of film noir, fantasy, science fiction and most of all pulp literature. This is Sam Spade, Humphrey Bogart meets Snape meets King Arthur meets The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It is the story of John Taylor, a supernatural private investigator, think long trench coat, fedora, that type of guy who has one superpower, he can find things. Having fled his home world of the night side, and he now resides in London, but he finds himself being pulled back into the night side. The night side being very, very strange, where you can find Elvis Presley eating hamburgers alongside King Arthur, alongside Al Capone. It is a strange blend, it is very pulpy, it is a very entertaining read, but it's much more than that. It actually has a great story arc over the 12 novels, and it has some super characters. The main character, John Taylor himself, he's not really a superhero, he's a bit of an anti-hero, um, he has the right kind of morals, although they tend to go somewhat grey throughout uh, the story in an otherwise very black and white world. And these books don't muck about, they know what they are and they don't take themselves seriously. I wouldn't say it is satire, but it certainly isn't highbrow lit. And yet, this is a series that is very entertaining to read. So if you don't take yourself too seriously and you're looking for a fantasy page-turning series with great character development and an overarching story, then the Nightside series by Simon R. Green should be on your TBR. Next one up is possibly my most favorite book of all times, and that's saying a lot. It is House of the Musk by Kader Abdullah. Kader Abdullah is an Iranian author who was forced to flee uh, Iran somewhere in the 80s. Um, he came to the Netherlands and hoped to follow in the footsteps of one of his great-grandfathers who was a famous Persian-Iranian writer. Now he has written a lot of books um, in which he tries to explain the whole situation in Iran today. And in my opinion there is no more beautiful book than The House of the Mosque. Now, The House of the Mosque is something totally different. It is a very strange combination of, uh, on the one hand, a very beautifully written, poetical, almost fantastical story about this, this little house, this little community, on one hand. And on the other hand, there is this, this brutal, real-life story about religious oppression and, and war, basically. House of the Mosque is a tale about um, a mosque and a little community around it in Iran somewhere by the end of the 70s. They have a very traditional lifestyle, they are happy, they are content, they have their own ideas, they have their own way to organize their community and then the Islamic Revolution happens. And all of a sudden, suddenly there are people that are actually start dictating you on how to live your life, how to act, how to speak, how to dress. And it's totally different from what you're used to. This is a story about how this small, isolated community copes with the sudden change in religion and leadership. But it's not just a story about the struggles within the small community, it's also about how different people from the same family have different ideas and might even oppose each other. It is very beautifully written, it is translated in English as the House of the Mosque, and it is unlike 
any book I've ever read tackling a current affair, tackling something as religious oppression, that does it so beautifully. It is pure poetry, it is language at its best, and I don't say this often, but everyone should read The House of the Mosque by Kader Abdullah. Next one up is one for the detective and whodunit lovers, and it's The Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. Now, Anthony Horowitz and I go way back. He was one of my favorite youth authors when I was young. But throughout his career, he made a switch into murder writing, and he does it ever so well. And you might not have read some of his books, but you have certainly seen some of his TV shows, because he became the lead crime writer for shows like Midsummer Murders. He has a great love for the classics. He knows his Agatha Christie, he knows his Sherlock Holmes, and he doesn't shy away to wink at those fandoms throughout his books. And the Magpie Murders? Well, this is a clever one. The Magpie Murders is basically a story within a story. It is a story about Susan Rayland, an unmarried editor of crime books who suddenly receives um, a manuscript of one of her best-selling writers, Alan Conway. It is his last book because with the manuscript, a suicide note is delivered. On top of that, the last chapter of the manuscript of the book seems missing. Now Susan has these nagging doubts in the back of her head about things not being right and she starts to investigate. So we have a classical murder story, someone tumbles from a tower, it doesn't seem to be a suicide, although there is a suicide note, so you, your typical Agatha Christie whodunit novel. But there's also a story about how crime writers write crime, how whodunit writers make up their stories. It is a very clever book, a very entertaining read for any fan of the genre. It is an absolute joy to read if you're a fan of the genre and you haven't uh, picked anything up by Anthony Horowitz, I would start here. The Magpie Murders, classical murder mystery with an extra touch. And since we are talking detectives now, let's talk about this series, the Cthulhu case books. Now the best way to describe this series is to say that H.P. Lovecraft and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had a love child and it's these books. Now the thing is, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. I think I've got almost everything, if not everything, somewhere in my shelves. Uh, I've read every story there is to read, and even some that are not written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Then again, I'm also a big H.P. Lovecraft fan. I've got all of his short stories, I've got all of his novels, I'm well versed in the Cthulhu mythos. So when I heard that these two fandoms were merging together in these books, I was scared. I was scared because I couldn't see how you would successfully merged two very different genres, one being your classical detective, the other being nihilistic science fiction fantasy. But boy, was I wrong. The Cthulhu casebooks and there are three merge these two worlds very effectively, almost seamlessly. It places Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson against these supernatural beings, these cultists, these these occult crimes, they will bring our detective up to the brink of insanity. In fact, I have never seen a better explanation for Sherlock using his cocaine solutions than in these books. Again, they read like your classical Sherlock Holmes with characters that are very well done, but in a fantastical supernatural setting. It has the occult, it has all of the unpronounceable names that we know and love H.P. Lovecraft for, and it works very well. They are dark, gothic page turners with elements of horror, detective and fantasy, I guess. So again, if you're a fan of the genres, do pick them up because they're very well worth it. And last but certainly not least, we'll, we'll end with a modern classic, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Now here's the story. James Baldwin um, in the 50s is a black, homosexual writer. And he has to flee the United States because of the racism and the prejudice against. And he knows that he can never be just a writer. He will always be that black writer or that homosexual writer. So in Europe, he finds himself a bit socially alienated. It's a whole new world. It's perhaps not as different from the United States as he has hoped. So he writes about his experiences and frustrations. Giovanni's Room is about an American man, an expat who is living in Paris and he is torn. He is torn between his social desires, he has a fiancé back home with uh, 
certain value set with a lot of money behind her and his sexual own desire for men here in Paris. The entire story is narrated by David, who is the American expat, and is described as the knight who leads him up to the most terrible morning of his life. It is a beautifully written book with lots of empathy and in my opinion it has opened a more general public discussion about same-sex relationships. It does come with uh, certain trigger warnings, it talks about social alienation, it talks about toxic masculinity, it tackles discrimination against LGBTQ+. It's not a big book, but there's a lot. And although it ranks on the BBC 100 most influential novels list, you hardly ever see it recommended somewhere. So I will happily champion Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin any day. And there you have it, five rather unknown books or series that are absolutely worth reading, at least according to me. So let's talk some more down into the comments. Have you read any of these books? Or which one are you going to look into? Let me know and we'll talk some more. So that's it for me for this week. Thanks for watching, but should you need some more recommendations, you can always look here. <laughs>